And um, so this is just a third installment of just going over broadly a bunch of different longevity pathways and the current state of um, longevity research. So I'm gonna share uh, directly, maybe I should do it to the PDFs. And we're gonna start with uh, proteolysis. Um, so here we go. All right, hopefully everyone can see this. This is just the, this is the thing that I'm, I'm building. So um, just an overview. So uh, the proteasome and the, uh, the, the way proteolysis works is it's a lot like autophagy where it's about protein breakdown, except in this way, uh, it's more like a scalpel than a, a dumpster. Um, you're trying to destroy individual proteins and this uh, object on the right-hand side, is a bit, bit of a feedback, so I'm gonna mute. Um, this thing on the right-hand side is the proteasome. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex of different uh, proteins. And what happens is that the protein gets sort of filled in, um, threaded in from one end and chopped up inside this middle complex and then um, ejected out the other end. The, so there's two big components to this, and that is the proteasome that's doing all the work um, and the ubiquitin. Ubiquitin tagging process um, happens for actually a number of different reasons, but the main one is to tag things for deconstruction, for um, tagging proteins for um, recycling. And the way that it happens is uh, a bunch of ubiquitin chain uh, gets put onto, like at first there's a little tag of ubiquitin and then it gets made into a giant chain. And then the proteasome says, hey, I need to degrade this thing. And then it um, chops it up. So the question is, how do we uh, use this? And the next step that people, all the activity seems to be around right now are protax protein, uh, proteolysis targeting chimeras. Um, and it's really interesting, actually, it's, it's super cool. So uh, what they do is they can, you can, you can build a, it's like a, a two part, like a dumbbell almost looking uh, protein. One side has an E3 ligase binding domain. So it's gonna recruit uh, ubiquitin machinery. Um, and then the other part is, attaches to the protein that you want to degrade. And when you, when this thing, this protac comes in and, it, and it attaches to the protein that you're trying to degrade, then it will allow it to be ubiquitinated and then destroyed by the cell's own machinery. Uh, this allows you to target proteins that previously were untargetable by any other process. Um, it also allows downstream inhibition of functions. So rather than trying to do uh, gene knockouts where like, you, you take the DNA, you slice off a chunk of it, and you, uh, and you remove that. Uh, you, can just, you can just clear out the proteins all that, like, just at that level of control. And then it still has the gene. So once you want to see what happens if the proteins come back, you, all you have to do is just stop putting in the protax, and you'll get the, the protein levels will return. So it's a very interesting new method of um, inhibition. Uh, that is only been recently discovered, and it's. I think it's kind of expensive. So, um, but and maybe there's some cheap projects for the, there for Vita Dao somewhere. But that's where most of the um, activity seems to be around at this point in time. Uh, and then, okay, this is just timeline stuff. Oh yeah, there's a few different uh, organizations. Okay. Let's move on to uh, is this is this gonna keep sharing? Let's move on to the extracellular matrix. Oh, you know, before I do that, uh, does anybody have any uh, 
comments or, or questions about proteolysis in general? Okay. Uh, ECM is um, it's pretty important um, to understand for longevity. Basically, well, let's just go over the components first. Uh, elastin, collagen, and glycoproteins are the big, big uh, categories of molecules involved. Um, elastin and collagen are stretchy and non-stretchy uh, proteins that just are like fibers. Uh, and then glycoproteins are proteins with uh, glycation. So there's sugars attached to proteins and that kind of gets into the mix and stabilizes the whole structure. This uh, extracellular matrix is quite pervasive in our bodies. It's how um, the cells kind of build that, that tissue. Um, it builds connections between cells uh, and allows the cells to stretch and uh, maintain structure. Um, it turns out that collagen is the most abundant protein in our bodies by far. Uh, collagen one is the most abundant protein in our bodies. So if we figure out how to either stabilize or regenerate the extracellular matrix, we're gonna figure out the majority of protein regeneration in our bodies. So that's it's, it's pretty important. Um, so the next big step for ECM is to rebuild it. And that is going to be, uh, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. So there's a lot of misinformation about why, how much regeneration um, the ECM undergoes. And some of that was, um, a product of really early experiments, and I can go to the timeline. So in 1950, they did the first uh, collagen experiments where they they were trying to look for um, how fast the collagen turned over in a, in a like a, a rat or something like that. And what they found was they thought it was going to be static over the entire lifetime. And that's where this notion that um, your collagen doesn't regenerate comes from is this uh, paper in 1950. Um, a lot more discoveries were made and people kept revisiting the, the concept of a static ECM um, over and over. And recently, you know, uh, people were like, oh, wait a minute, the collagen half-life in rats is actually 45 days to 250 days, um, depending on the tissue that it was found in and blah, blah, blah. And then more people are like, oh, wait a minute, you know, the collagen half-life is around 30 days in the, in the skin. And that's going to be for collagen seven. So there's, there's more recent data that seems to be overturning the idea that your collagen is fixed. Um, and it makes a lot of sense uh, anecdotally because one of the things that, um, sorry, one of the things that is uh, a big problem is pneumonia. And the reason why pneumonia is uh, pathogenic is because it releases an elastase, a bacterial elastase that will degrade your, your lung collagen. And so it's basically ripping apart your extracellular matrix in your lungs, which is then, it's, it's gonna be hard to breathe uh, if that happens. But it's possible to completely recover from pneumonia when you're young. The only way that that would be possible is if it's possible to rebuild your ECM, right? That's that's, it has to be the case that you can rebuild your ECM in order to recover from pneumonia. As you get older, pneumonia gets to be a really much bigger problem because the repair machinery for recovering from a pneumonia episode is breaking down. And now all of a sudden you can't repair the elastin that got eaten up by the pneumonia pathogen, the bacteria. So then it, then it becomes like a, you know, how do you, how do you fix that? Um, I don't really have any ideas. I just thought that the pneumonia component of this was a very interesting thing that um, people should probably know. Where it's a, it's whenever you're, whenever you stop being able to recover from pneumonia, that represents a threshold of aging that you've passed. Where it's like now you can't restore your ECM. Something in your body must have changed. So um, that's 
thought was important. Any, any questions on uh, this section before we move on? Okay. Uh, let me stop sharing. Let's see here. Um, Clotho is important, but I did not finish exporting this as a, or I didn't really finish this section, but I might as well talk about it same way. Okay. Uh, and this is just, it's in um, Adobe, uh, what's it called? In design format. So there's gonna be these weird lines around it, but that's okay. So Clotho is, uh, well, it's a protein that's associated with exercise. It's a protein that's associated with longevity. It's very weirdly associated with longevity. It seems to be, um, let me just zoom in here on this image. Um, it seems to be associated with a lot of different longevity functions and uh, regeneration, triggering of regeneration. Um, it's got PPAR agonists apparently, and you know it's it's tied into um, for for some reason it spikes about a half an hour after acute exercise. Super important. Uh, it's a super important protein if if you're going to understand longevity. I'm not entirely sure to what extent a lot of this information is reliable. It just seems like it's all over the place. So it seems a little bit early to um, start doing therapies related to it. But there's all sorts of very interesting observations associated with Clotho. So uh, I think that the next step, in my opinion, is to just determine the larger network. So how does it hook into the rest of the body? What is its actual purpose originally? Um, and is it some kind of, is it some kind of a weird generalized protein that promotes regeneration? That just seems like, it just seems bizarre that that would be the case. So um, yeah, not, not to, uh, I'm not, uh, does anybody else know more about this and want to speak up at this point or? Uh, okay. Not, uh, I'm probably less versed than I should be about it, but um, it's, it's interesting. I'll, I'll just stop with that. Uh, okay. Senescence. Let's see. Show senescence. Okay, uh, everyone here should probably be at least partially aware of senescence. Uh, the concept is actually very old. A lot of people think that it started mid-century with um, Leonard Hayflick. It was actually, the, the original concept of senescence was in, um, introduced into scientific for paper format in 1891 by Charles Sedgwick, ah, Charles Sedgwick Minot. So he basically, uh, came up with the concept of senescence and defined it. And then um, Leonard Hayflick was the one who showed uh, that fibroblasts have a senescent limit. Um, Charles Sedgwick Mill, by the way, defined it as uh, the, and I can show you this actual paper. It's, it's interesting. Um, let's switch to this paper. Can you guys see this uh, rejuvenation paper or is it still sharing the PDF of senescence? Yes, we see it. Okay. Um, so if you go, this is a based, uh, this is back if uh, they were doing these experiments on uh, rodent, um, what was it? Guinea pigs, weight of guinea pigs. So here, is where organisms are created young and grow old and the old produce young successors. The passage from youth to old age is best termed senescence, the procreation of the young rejuvenation. So he defines senescence as um, aging. And now here we are about hundred years later where people are like, hey, senescence causes aging. And it's just like, okay, well, great. Um, so, 
it's pretty well known. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm, I think I'm gonna um, change out that next step. But what happens is a cell becomes unable to divide anymore. And this is how the, the definition has changed a little bit. It's still alive. It's just unable to divide anymore. Um, and so it exhibits a senescent phenotype. It starts exhibiting a senescence associated secretory uh, profile, SASP, which is that it throws out inflammatory proteins, um, causes a cancerous environment around itself, uh, basically just is causing problems for the surrounding cells and doesn't uh, have the ability to repair itself and um, is not dividing anymore. Uh, so there's a lot of different people with a lot of different expertise and they will uh, be able to tell you a lot more than me. One of the things that I thought was very interesting about this whole uh, concept is the use of senolytics um, and the embracing of senolytics by a lot of people <laughs> who are old because um, philosophically, the concept of senolytics is these senescent cells cannot be rescued. We should just eliminate them from the body and then the body will become more healthy. Uh, this brings up the prospect that the elimination of aged units in a body whole is a good idea. And that brings up the prospect of um, you know, a overburdened healthcare system, which is searching for a solution. And uh, if this is the thing that really works, what does that say about potential um, societal answers for um, an aging population? Uh, not good. Uh, the implications are, um, a little bit disturbing, but they, I mean, I feel like they needs to be talked about at some point. Nobody seems to want to talk about, or at least nobody that I've seen wants to talk about that aspect of it. If, if senolytics is the way to, um, to making the body healthier, um, then yeah. So anyway, um, beyond that, uh, getting back to it, uh, if we eliminate senescent cells, it's possible that you can um, reduce the amount of uh, terribleness that's that's within your body. And a lot of different analytics are being explored. Nothing really works right now, uh, but there's options, and there seems to be a lot of investment in the space. Um, I, if I was if I was looking at any project involving analytics, I would just wait for uh, the myriad of projects that are going on to sort of either produce results or fizzle out before um, trying to jump into this whole thing. Um, I put down here that thymus regeneration was the next step. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Greg Faye is already working on trying to re re um, regenerate the thymus. So um, I had to talk to him about that. Okay, we can go to um, actually, maybe I should just ask you guys, uh, is there anything else on this list that um, you want to hear about that seems interesting? Let's see, maybe cryonics. Sure. And maybe menopause. Cryonics and menopause, okay. Um, we'll start with cryonics. So it's a pretty old idea that when things get cold, um, change slows down and we don't want to change. So we want to get make ourselves cold. Uh, is is the, the general principle behind cryonics. You, you freeze a person, uh, they can last a really long time, ostensibly. Um, and, you know, we're at the point, though, where technically we can freeze people. We don't, nobody knows if they're doing it correctly, but companies like Alcor and Cryonics Institute are freezing people. Uh, there's no thawing of people yet. Um, and so the general principle of cryonics is following the same trajectory as what the ancient Egyptians did uh, about 2000, more than 2000 years ago. 
at this point, which was they had a body preservation technology. It was called embalmation. Uh, they wanted to preserve themselves. They didn't want to, they were smart enough that they understood you know, mortality and, and death and whatnot. And they said to themselves, okay, well, we're definitely gonna die, but maybe we can use this technology of embalmation to preserve our bodies and then people in the future can revive us. And it was very interesting because the entire society apparently was thinking like this. From the peasantry all the way up into the pharaohs, everyone was pretty much obsessed with immortality. Uh, so the, um, what the, the, the difference between the peasants and the pharaohs was how you could store the body. So they all embalmed themselves. It was a relatively cheap process. Even, even um, people very low on the economic ladder could afford it but they couldn't afford the storage. So peasants would store themselves in gravel mounds. Uh, and then as you go up the ranks, then the tombs get a little bit better built. And then at the very top, you have the pyramids. This was the original <laughs> safe space uh, built to contain a body to be untouched for thousands of years. And they succeeded at that part of the technology. They, were, they had succeeded at building a location which would not be affected by the weather, um, which would rebuff the sands of time, so to speak. They just, it's just that when you scramble your brain and you pull it out through your nose, uh, it's very difficult to <laughs> put that back together. But, but the, the general concept was there and uh, props for them for, for trying as hard as they did. Um, so that's, uh, and cryonics, then the story of cryonics is, and the logic being used behind cryonics is very similar to that kind of logic. We can freeze a body. Can we revive it? They don't know. Nobody knows. Um, is, it, is it a way, like, is, does it give people hope, existential hope that they can get revived? Yeah, it does. Um, we have no idea how long these companies can keep people in cryogenic preservation. What if they fold? What happens to the bodies? How, how long in storage? It feels like they're claiming storage is pretty stable, but is it you know, stable enough to last 100, 200 years that maybe it might take? I don't know. Uh, companies will go under very quickly. So in the, in the cryonics pathway, um, there is a, a strain of the research that is very useful, which is going to be Oregon vitrification. Um, in order to vitrify or freeze a body, uh, I should explain vitrification, I guess. Um, so vitrification is where when you freeze something, rather than the water forming ice crystals, it forms a glassy, uh, it, it turns into a glass, basically. And the way that you get this to be done in at least blood, blood cells um, with current technology is you add a bunch of glycerol to it. The glycerol then acts like an antifreeze. And when the water molecules slow down, they don't assemble into crystals. They just sort of slow down in place and just sort of everything just sort of stops. And that's really great for preserving cell membranes and for doing other things. Um, this is technology that is relatively old. It's pretty stable. It's pretty known. So, um, but, but frozen blood is a lot different than like a frozen organ. And uh, nobody so far has been able to successfully vitrify a human organ and then thaw it out. If the cryonics people want to thaw out a body and revive it, uh, they're gonna have to be able to thaw out an organ. So this is something that is um, across the field something that everyone should be wanting to pursue, even the people that are on the extreme ends of things, but also uh, mainstream science because organ vitrification opens up an entire industry. If you figure out how to do that, um, you know, organ donation changes completely. Um, the process of growing and then storing organs, uh, custom organs for people, like uh, you grow it on a scaffold with organ growth technology, and then you, well, maybe you have a kidney lying around or a liver lying around whenever you need it, rather than having to time it just right, having to have the injury happen first and then going like, well, okay, we can try to grow something one, put you on some kind of life support while we, no, 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 no. You just have it sitting there, okay? Just 
and people can order it pre beforehand. It'll be sitting in a, in a storage container. And when you have an injury, you just yank that thing out of storage, thaw it out, plant it into you, and you're good to go. Um, could be really good for uh, just just medicine in general. This is a this is a, something that could be a really huge breakthrough. Person that's closest to this uh, would <laughs> have to be Greg Fahey. Greg Fay, sorry, Greg Fay. Um, he's vitrified a rabbit kidney. Unfortunately, they killed the rabbit, uh, or I think that it only lived nine days. And then they, I think they did it, they might've done it a second time, but they ended up killing the rabbit um, to study the effects. Uh, they need to redo that experiment and get it longer, um, or just skip to trying to do it in a human. Uh, that'd be pretty interesting, but a lot more animal testing is probably the way to go uh, at this point, but he's the only one who's close to doing that. So uh, menopause. Uh, let's go to menopause. Very interesting because menopause is a, a direct piece of evidence for programmed aging. It's just really weird uh, that why would the body just shut off automatically? Um, so if we take a look at the nature of life, uh, one of the things that is widely accepted as, uh, <laughs> an important facet of life is reproduction and reproducing as much as possible for various different species. Uh, so in humans and four different species of whales, the cycle of menstruation just ceases on its own and People have th different theories as to why that is. One of them is the grandmother hypothesis. That's useful to, for a tribal situation or a group of um, individuals to have older caretaker type of people who are not competing for um, sexual attention, but who are there just to help you know, raise young and help them um, with uh, survival and fitness. Uh, the problem, with this hypothesis is that it applies to basically everything that's tribal, but we don't see, like most tribal organisms don't have menopause. So you'd have to explain why the grandmother hypothesis only applies to humans and four species of whales uh, for some reason, even though there's a lot of species on this planet that would benefit from that kind of a system and have had the evolutionary time to evolve this kind of thing the same way that we have. Uh, it's just, so uh, we're menopause in, in general, the, the structure of it gets into oocytes, oocyte attrition, oocyte regeneration, um, presence of oocyte stem cells, which was actually just discovered, uh, or it was, it was posited in humans in 2004. It's very weird. I went through the, the history of this and uh, it's a very weird thing because it turns out that when in 1921, it was noted that ovaries have the ability to grow new oocytes in postnatal birds um, after re mechanical removal of portions of the ovary. Basically what they did was they took a bunch of chickens because it's really easy to see the oocytes in chickens because they get so huge. They turn into eggs, right? So they have to get large. So you can actually, with with old technology, you could actually count them. Whereas the oocytes in a human, you can't count with, unless you had a really great microscope. So they didn't have that back then. So what they would do is they take the oocytes of a, of a chicken and they would like, I don't know how they did it, but they would, they would like pull them out of the chicken, count them and somehow like re return them to the chicken. Um, and then they would, they would uh, do that again, but then they would like injure the, the, the thing. So they would like rip like half of the oocytes out and then they would put the rest back into the chicken. Turns out when you do that, the number of oocytes that grows back is about the same as the original ovary size. So it can regenerate to full size after the bird is like kind of matured. Um, and so it's clear that it's possible for the ovary to generate new oocytes after birth and, and way later. It just doesn't want to. 
for some reason. Uh, probably some kind of mechanical thing, probably based on the size of the organism. But then for some reason, uh, people, this, this concept that you're, you're born with all the, the oocytes, you'll ever, all the eggs you'll ever have um, gotten to uh, the conversation somehow, this, this uh, study got forgotten. And it was, a, it was a widely held belief that you're gonna be born with all the eggs you'll ever have for a very long time. 2004 rolls around, they, they start bringing back the concept of human um, germline stem cells, uh, oocyte stem cells. And that just started bringing the conversation back into maybe you can actually regenerate the ovaries. And then that means that if you can do that, what, can you reverse menopause? So right now the current th therapy that appears to work, I couldn't get in touch with the people that did it, but platelet, um, uh, PRP, um, it's, it's, a, it's a platelet therapy where they take concentrated platelets and they inject it into the person and um, it somehow seems to regenerate the oocyte or the, the ovaries. Um, a company called Inovium is kind of spearheading this. Uh, haven't really heard much from them recently, but they're going to be the people to talk to if you ever wanted to get um, information on how well the state of the art is going. Uh, and so the, the next step, actually, I think for this whole field of trying to fix menopause is to really define what menopause is. There's a schism right now where menopause means a very specific things. It means the cessation of menstruation, menstruation, but not that many animals in the world menstruate. So there could be a lot more examples of the cessation of reproduction, of like a controlled cessation of reproduction amongst animals that do not menstruate. And for our purposes, we're interested in that because that's functionally menopause. Even though there's no menstruation occurring, functionally it's the same thing philosophically. The animal is stopping its reproduction on its own for some reason. Um, and that, that's a very key part of aging. So we would like to know what animals do that. Uh, so it's humans and four species of whales that are the only things that undergo menopause <clears throat> as it's currently defined. And I think that uh, we need to figure out more about this. Um, and I think that by understanding how many species undergo the controlled cessation of reproduction, it would better it would allow us to better figure out why this is happening and why it only happens for certain species. Primates, a lot of primates do not have this. They don't undergo controlled sensation of reproduction at all, um, much less menopause. And we're the ones we did. That's weird. Why, why us and, and four species of whales? That just seems really weird. That's like a, we that's a really weird selection of species to uh, so I don't think we know enough about the core nature of this um, but we should probably we live longer. <laughs> sorry what because we live longer and so it's relevant well apes live pretty long but then there's there's um, you know compared like how do you like if you're looking at lifespan per kilogram Mm -hmm. then apes don't really live that long. Kind of, but I feel like they still live long enough where you could probably experience the, the benefits of the grandmother hypothesis or whatever other hypothesis people come up with for why menopause exists. I think that they would be able to experience the benefits of that, um, but they don't have this system. Um, Personally, what I think it is, is uh, an intense competition amongst the oocytes. I think that there's some kind of, I think it's probably really related to oocyte attrition and the nature of it and how maybe it doesn't ever stop. 
happening. This uh, oocyte attrition event that happens before birth where a bunch of oocytes, um, potentially they're killing each other. And what's happening is that as over time, that just keeps going on. The oocytes are just attacking each other all the time um, as part of a, a internal artificial selection process. And that um, it just, since it never stops, it just, it'll keep on attritioning down, but the rate drops because the number of attackers is dropping, right? So if they're responsible for killing each other and the overall number of oocytes falls, then the, the death rate of the oocytes will also fall um, logarithmically, which is kind of what you see with this graph. Um, this goes pre-birth, the oocytes numbers spike and then they just fall and continue to fall off in a kind of a logarithmic fashion um, as age progresses. And this is my own assumption. This is just a, and it's, it's based off of several layers of assumptions. Number one, the assumption that oocytes are attacking each other. Um, number two, that menopause is basically some kind of a, a, based on a threshold of when there's too few oocytes. But then that seems weird as well. Like, why would that be? There's a bunch of assumptions, um, but that's that's the best interpretation that I've come up with for what's going on. Um, yeah, so that takes care of that. Um, I think that was, yeah, that's pretty much. Oh, uh, yeah, curing menopause is pretty important. Um, and, and to a lesser extent, andropause, uh, it would more from a comfort perspective and just like, there's a lot of just general discomfort and weird things that happen, aging things that happen for postmenopausal and postandropausal people. And it would just be nice to have that all figured out. I think that, but I think that that that's mechanism is tied into the fundamental nature of life. So that might be like one of the last things that that falls um, in, in this whole list of advancements. We could go over, uh, well, what, what else, anything else on this list that you guys want to see? Um, Organ replacement, vasculature construction. Did you talk about that a little bit? Okay. Um, artificial organ, organ replacement. All right. So I think I might've covered artificial organs last time or two times ago, but uh, this is gonna be different. This is basically where we're, we're trying to create uh, organs using a patient's own tissues, own stem cells. And this is just, it's really cool. And they're making a lot of progress on it. Um, it's gonna be mostly, uh, oh God, what was that institution? It was down here, Wake Forest. Wake Forest Institute is gonna be where all the hub of activity on this is happening. Um, there's also several companies doing 3D bioprinting that is, this is what's driving 3D bioprinting space right now. In, and um, the, the big goal that a lot of people are trying to get to. So what do you do? Well, there's two ways to build an organ. One is you make a scaffold by taking all the ECM of an organ you remove all of the old cells, you purge them, and you have this scaffold of like a lung or a bladder or something. And then you impregnate it with a new patient's stem cells in such a way that, and then you bathe it in the right kind of fluids and in such a way that the cells will then regrow onto that scaffold, fill in all the holes and self-organize into an organ. You take that organ, you put it into the new patient uh, who's the, the stem cell donor patient. Voila, you've got yourself, uh, well, they did a bladder at this point successfully. Um, I think the what I heard was like at least 11 years of um, life, if not more, I think that um, was from that bladder. Uh, it's just really cool. The second way of making an organ is you take a person's cells and you just print out the organ. So with a 3D bioprinter, you just start laying down rows and rows of cells and you switch between the correct cells for the correct locations. And if you can just assemble the organ, you know, as a whole with the right cells in the right locations, they'll just sort of, you know, 
fill in all the little blanks and, and start to work as an organ. They'll, they'll self-assemble um, into an organ. There's, some, there's a lot of progress happening, but the big thing that is uh, a problem right now is the vascularization. Um, and that's the, the problem is the capillaries. The large blood vessels are fine. The people can deal with them. Um, so arteries and blood vessels are no problem. It's the tiny capillaries, which cannot be printed. Not because, and this is interesting, because it's not because of the resolution size. I thought it was re resolution size for a while, but apparently you can get really good resolution with these 3D printers. If you're willing to wait for a while, you can get really great resolution, but that's, that's not the problem. The problem is that the capillaries themselves are made by elongated cells, like single cells that were been elongated into a tube. Um, and that cannot be printed uh, unless you have this, the tube cells assembled already. So that, and nobody has that. So it's actually a, a, a structure, a, a, a structural hurdle where no matter how good your resolution, you just can't print capillaries. Um, there are different types of solutions that have been tried to be used. Um, and I think this was, these were old. This, this is, uh, I think I, I didn't update this um, possible solution section, but basically, you can use, um, you can try to use like VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor to try to induce capillary formation, or you can try to induce capillary formation through other methods. Um, Electrospinning, uh, they try to make, it, make scaffolds for capillaries, but basically like it's not controlled growth. You just have this sort of mesh network and you're trying to like have the capillaries grow around it. And nothing's nothing's really standing out. The current batch of of solutions that people are coming up with is that maybe we can just ignore that problem and try to work around it. So um, I think I have him down here. It was Miller. So um, the Miller Lab at Rice University, and um, the guy who's uh, I forget his first name, but he, he's a uh, He's testing out a, a solution to the vascularization problem that could be over the next year, they'll find out whether it's good or not. Um, and we'll just have to see. I think that for this for this field, it's just there's a lot of people working on it with a lot of expertise, a lot better expertise about 3D printing, intersection of 3D printing and biology and um, organ uh, anatomy and organ biology. So we just sort of have to wait for them to have something that pops out as a potential solution. Um, I don't know if you've heard of NASA awarding, uh, um, who was it again? Wake Forest with a prize for fixing vascularization, except that they didn't make capillaries with it. They basically made a, a blood vessel with the method that they used. At least I don't think so. I, when I read it, what I understood of it is it's basically a rehash of technology that's already been um, put out. So it's kind of weird that NASA would award them. I think that they were just kind of like looking for an excuse to give them money or something like that. But um, it wasn't, I don't think that they solved the capillary problem. So that still exists and it's, it's still a hurdle. Uh, and if we can, if we can work around it, it'd be really great. Um, if we have to induce capillary formation, which I think, I feel like that's just going to be, you need to figure out how to do that, then it might take longer, but that's, that's where the bottleneck is for organ replacement. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, let's go to, Okay, um, hormones, such a general concept. Uh, so hormones is basically your chemical control of your body. Um, there's a lot of different hormone domains and a lot of different functions. We've got hypothalamus, pituitary, 
uh, pineal gland, thyroid, parathyroid, thymus, adrenal gland, pancreas, your gonads, all these are producing hormones. Um, all of these are active and participate and, um, and instrumental in maintaining the cycles of hormone production that go on in your body. Uh, it's such a broad category and yet I feel like it just has to be its own category because of um, the current methodology. So we have a uh, hormone replacement programs. That's, that's gonna be your typical uh, snake oil salesman, anti-aging. Um, your typical like anti-aging lab is gonna be a hormone replacement lab, as far as I'm aware, um, which technically, it works to a certain extent, you know, replace testosterone, replace estrogen, replace um, uh, the other type of estrogen. I forget what it is uh, at the moment. So replace growth hormone. Um, you'll see regenerative effects, right? Uh, how much cancer you're going to see alongside of it is uh, it varies from person to person, but replacing hormones will have you give regenerative effects and it's technology that works today. Um, we don't have the, we don't have the, uh, expertise to figure out how long or how, how much, uh, of each one to replace and how fast and how to replace it in a rhythmic cycle and whatnot. But it's working to a certain extent. Um, we just have to get more fundamental knowledge about biology in order to take us to the next level. So it is the top of the hour. I feel like uh, people are heading on out. Um, I think that's good enough for today. Uh, anything else that you guys wanted to see or talk about on this? That's great, Aaron. Well done, as usual. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's good to give the balanced uh, view on each of the, you know, choose any topic, ask me anything. It's great. Uh, I'll have to jump off, but we'll chat. I'll chat to you later. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Cool. All right. Um, oh crap. I didn't look at the, <laughs> I didn't look at the, uh, the chat. I am sorry. Um, so I should have been doing that probably. Okay. I'll see you guys later. <laughs>